What's up, everyone? Joe here. In this episode, Frank and I had the privilege of chatting with Jacob Fitzgerald and Scott Horst, two outstanding U.S. Air Force non-commissioned officers. During our discussion, we explored the challenges, rewards, and best practices associated with transitioning to a supervisory role. Enjoy. Live. Learning. Leadership. The Llama Lounge. Yo, welcome back to the Llama Lounge, a dialogue on all things life, learning, and leadership. I'm Joe Bogdan, and I am excited to have some amazing guests in the lounge today. Jacob Fitzgerald and Scott Horst, two U.S. Air Force non-commissioned officers I've had the privilege and honor of serving with while I was stationed at Spangdalem Air Base in Germany. What's going on, fellas? Hey, what's up, uh, sir? Yeah, man. You guys, you guys are looking great. <laughs> it looks like you, you, uh, life's been good to you guys, man. Uh, uh, it looks like I'm getting a little thicker in the neck. <laughs> hey, that's the normal Alaska thing, I think, right? You got you yeah. to put some, <laughs> I heard it's that. too cold. You know, yeah, you got to put on some weight to make sure you don't freeze to death out there. Yeah. <laughs> how how you doing, Scott? Pretty good. Uh, weather out here is pretty, pretty gloomy today, but I mean, I think overall everything is pretty solid. Yeah. Push up. I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. I got to run in today and um, got to talk to some amazing folks and I get to continue right now with you guys. So, and then uh, uh, one of uh, my buddies, Frank, he's, he's going to jump on here in a little bit. So it'll, it'll be a great time. Awesome. Yeah. So, Hey, so um, tell us a little bit about what's going on in your guys' neck of the woods. Um, we've been going through, you know, day 7,700 uh, whatever of this uh, whole quarantine. <laughs> COVID, yeah, yeah. quarantine slash restricted movement slash shelter at home slash we don't know what we're doing. Uh, so uh, it's been going on for a little bit and um, we talked to people from all over the place and they're all experiencing it in very different ways. So um, Jacob, how's it going? What's going on up in, um, up in Alaska? Um, it's, I don't want to say it's like back to normal because it's not, but I mean, masks are pretty much the new daily and like, it's like you're leaving for, for wherever you got to go. And it's like phone, wallet, keys, mask. Right. And, um, but, um, where, as far as work goes, it's like kind of the same thing. Like we're almost back to normal. Like everyone's working like what our old shifts were. It's just mm-hmm. now when we're in the trucks, got to have the masks on and whatnot. But I'd say it's almost it almost feels normal. I think we're getting used to it. So. Okay. You guys able to get toilet paper now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a minute I felt like Alaska had a, a, like the worst when I saw the store. Yeah. They're having a hard time getting stuff in, right? The Costco. Yeah. Cause the barges only come twice a week and like sometimes they don't have everything on there, I guess, but the Costco's were empty. No rice. And I was hurting. <laughs> uh, no toilet paper. <laughs> no rice. Oh, man. No rice and no toilet paper. That's devastating. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for me. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Scott, how about how about you where you're at? Uh, we're, we're still kind of doing our, our COVID shifts quarantine situation. Not, not necessarily quarantine, but like we have our three on three ops to kind of mitigate the spread of, um, you know, whatever whether it's COVID or just seasonal stuff and just complicating things further. So we're doing that. Um, as far as workloads, we're just kind of, we're hitting roofs and stuff. You know, it's pretty, pretty normal work stuff, but like, like uh, Jacob was saying that we got the mass situation in the trucks and um, you know, other than that, like as far as pushing jobs and stuff, it's same as usual. Yeah. How about the uh, local community where you're at? I mean, um, the mask was kind of a normal thing out there anyway, but yeah, you know. it, it, that never really put any weird, like, inhibition on the community as far as like the mask is like you said it, it's pretty standard um so it, it's nothing out of the ordinary for them um so uh, I, I think as far as uh, the, the public health emergency i got that i think lifted relatively recently but they're still you know they're cautioning people as far as like traveling and things like that to be mindful of you know staying clean healthy etc yeah yeah definitely so just for our listeners in case everybody's like where the heck are they uh jacob's up in alaska at uh at j bear joint base i'm yeah, ferguson okay. and uh scott's over at yakota right yes yeah so yeah in japan so um yeah japan's amazing i imagine like off base though is, is it like still just as dense or is it uh is it a little thinned out or it, it's so, some spots are like ghost towns right now mm. and, and it's not and it's not really like the restrictions on our end I have, have been slightly lessened because it was just like, hey, you can only go within like the immediate area. Like 
on base and like maybe grocery shopping off base if you need to. Uh, but recently they opened it up to about like 30 minute radius or so uh, as far as like where, where we can go and uh, but still kind of like avoiding places that might have more than X amount of people or, okay. uh, still masking up and stuff. 30 minutes, huh? Yeah, that, that's hard for me to like envision because when I was stationed in Japan, 30 minutes don't get you very far with the traffic. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you've got maybe like, uh, like a little small sub city in each direction and that's about it. Yeah, that's that's what I think, man. So, uh, have you had to deal with the koi pond yet? Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> Not the koi pond itself, but just the area, like uh, that. I mean, it, it, just simple things like easy fixes stuff. But uh, of course, they, they automatically come up as like a three alpha work task. Uh, yeah, yeah. Even though, you know, it's high the, high priority, <laughs> <laughs> top priority mission: the koi pond at Yokota Air Base, man. Oh it, man. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for us engineers, man. I mean, we're, we're we're always working really hard. We're always the best looking and the smartest in the room. Is it, you know, it's it's difficult. It's a difficult <laughs> life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, hey, let's start off by hearing a little bit about each of you. Um, I mean, every airman has a story we talk about all the time, but it's true, and we often glean wisdom and insight from those stories. So, I was thinking, Scott, can you share a little bit about yourself? How did Scott Horse become the Scott Horse he is today? So, how far are we going back? Like when let's I'm talk- like little or like yeah yeah let's talk about <laughs> how you grew up and then maybe you know what 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 made you make a dive into the air force and you know a little bit about okay. that too so uh i grew i grew up in central texas i was born in austin um lived with my grandparents for a little bit when i was younger they they lived in san antonio uh my parents worked a lot my dad worked up at like 3m and dell and then my mom was an accountant so uh my grandparents uh held it down so I put me through Catholic school and stuff like that. I stayed with them, for, I think, about seven years. Uh, and then about, I think, when it was like fifth grade, sixth grade, I went to Austin to public school with my parents. Um, and that worked, worked out balance. So it was a little more feasible for them. And then, uh, so, uh, yeah, I did that. And then I graduated from high school in Austin from Crockett High School. Uh, went to community college for like a year and then burnt out because, you know, the life's not important at that time you know it's like yeah. it, it, it everything is taken for granted so uh essentially that was where you know i, I you know was, i wound up being like a pretty serious relationship for a while and i was like oh you know i'm gonna join the military to help her pay bills blah 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 uh and of course that didn't pan out but you know i'm still here <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, it's, it's turned out to be like way way better for me than i ever anticipated um it sounds really corny but it's like one of those like you you really you join without a reason and then you find your purpose while you're here type of thing mm-hmm. so um it's that's that's me in a nutshell pretty much i mean a lot of uh austin's a pretty liberal city uh if if anyone listening is not familiar with austin and you keep austin weird you know all that yeah you know, i mean i i you know before i got into the military any and even after like i was going to a lot of punk shows and like um listening to like uh dc dc area hardcore punk <laughs> and stuff like that you know so like moshing getting like beer cans thrown at my face like nice you know um so uh and then of course like my high school was a pretty diverse area too so that i, I like to bring you know that that sort of interpersonal experience as, uh, as like a mediator in like the workplace and stuff like that too so but that's, yeah that's me very cool yeah actually austin is a place I, I was planning on visiting this year before the the covid hit right um <laughs> because i just heard great things about that um town and i i hear now it's pretty much getting so everybody figured out the secret so it's so mm-hmm. packed that you know, living there is not really feasible without making we're, tons we're of money now we're yeah. looking at buying land out there but it's just yeah. like you yeah. know my, not an awesome proper probably like maybe like an hour out somewhere right like that. right i mean it's got to be unique because i mean liberal very liberal city in texas i mean yeah, it's, <laughs> it's very 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 uh what do they call that uh a, a juxtaposition yeah 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 absolutely. general dynamic yeah <laughs> awesome cool thanks for sharing brother all right jacob your turn um i grew up a military brat my dad was in the air force i think he served about 21 years retired as a master uh, i hated moving around as a kid <laughs> always having to make new friends and i was like Man, i'm never gonna join the air force <laughs> and then uh, um a, a couple years uh, i think he retired and we moved one more time but before that we i was we were in dias for mm. six years and i kind of mm. had like mm. what i thought was going to be my future laid out and then we moved and i kind of got all scrubbed so then i was like well i guess i'll join the air force to try and get some stability didn't end up getting the job i wanted 
which was uh, linguists a lot. But then uh, when I got this, I, I wasn't too excited at first, but then it kind of grew on me. And now I, I actually do love the job and love the culture that CE is and whatnot and uh, tried to make the best out of it. But um, yeah, I guess that's, that's much more brief than Scott. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> no, it's all good, man. So yeah, he no. was actually, so yeah, I guess, so Scott was, he was a senior airman when he got to Spangdalem shortly after I got there. And that was like my first duty station. And I got put on his work crew. That's where we kind of like, I kind of started learning a lot from him. And uh, he'll tell you, I had, a, I had quite the mouth when I was a younger airman and uh, wouldn't really um, watch what I was saying. And I had a habit of saying the wrong things when the, when the highest ranking people were walking by, but uh, he helped me grow into who I am today, I guess is what I'm getting at. So. Oh man, that's surprising. I, I would have never thought that fits. <laughs> that's, good job, Scott. Good job, Scott. <laughs> so cool. Well, look who's joined us. Frank. What's up, Frank? Hey, what's up guys? How you doing? Well, I'm awesome. Good. Good, man. This is, yeah. Uh, the bros, the bros, the supervisors. Um, I jumped on it. I was like, all right, yeah, let's, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I failed to let uh, Frank know that that we were doing this at this time. Uh, I, I think I thought I told him, and then <laughs> it was one of those. Not, and then, so I hit him up like 35 <laughs> seconds before we started. Like, hey, Frank, you jumping yeah. on this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I'm just uh, watching golf in the morning. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's an adaptable airman. He's fine. <laughs> so cool, man. So speaking of that, you kind of brought, brought up the whole topic of bros and supervisors. So I was chatting with you guys um, previously, you know, a couple weeks ago, and, and you guys brought up the topic, bros to supervisors. And I thought, man, that's amazing. What drove you to feel, you know, that that was a topic that we need to kind of explore? Yeah, Jimmy, are you on me? Oh, you can get it. Okay. Uh, well, I think just because of, like our, our our time at Spang Dom together, so we were stationed there from what like twenty fifteen. You were there like twenty fourteen, Jake? No, I was there twenty fifteen through twenty nineteen. Okay, so relatively the same amount. Yeah, about the same, just a yeah. few months off. Yeah. So uh, that was like a big part of our of our journey. There was kind of like you know I I made staff and then uh, aligned for tech out of there. And Fitz made staff, uh, or Jacob made, made staff, and you know we kind of had that uh, that whole uh, what do you want to call it? It was, it was a conundrum sort of place before you, like as like a as someone that's like trapped between two worlds, like trying to have to figure out how to navigate forward, um, and and instead of having it as an excuse, using it as more of like a a force multiplier in, in the in the regards of like you know interpersonal stuff in the workplace. Hmm. Okay, so did you did you directly supervise Fitz at all? No, we okay. just had a lot in common as far as like um, our personal stuff, like the, there's hobbies and things like that, like shoes and you know. He pretty of- much did though. He's being modest. My <laughs> my first supervisor was a part of a, a team separated from the shop, mm-hmm. and uh, so he wasn't he wasn't there to directly supervise me as often as Horst was also there. Mm-hmm. So or scott i mean and uh yeah. it's all good yeah. for our listeners just in case we get confused jacob is fitz and scott is horse so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> interchangeable <laughs> <laughs> so okay so so you're like indirectly supervising in a lot of ways uh and bringing them up and teaching them how to not say the wrong things at the wrong time yeah pretty cool time and place has yeah. been super huge like yeah. for me because like like the especially with the newer people with newer folks in the military like um like i came in like a very transitional period like legit like during basic training like when all that garbage was happening right that was the section i was in it was happening while i was there like the people that taught me in basic training were the people that like got reduced to like airmen first class you know airmen and then Mm -hmm. sent on their way um so that like you know it was kind of like pivotal like i got there when the got here when the eprs changed when when you know things a lot of things were changing so I got to kind of see, you know, the, the sort of transition of, of the culture in the Air Force. Um, so uh, the time and place piece, you know, the expectations of leadership, I think, are, are different now because, you you know, people come out of basic and there's a lot more ground to cover, I think. You know, not, 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 in, not by like, not to the detriment of anybody, but just because the, the, the makeup of the, of the curriculum is different now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Uh, so there's a lot more on our end that we have to do, like, you know, facilitate, like, people knowing the time and place as far as, like, being, you know, informal or formal or whatever. And being CE, uh, 
you know, yeah. it, it's we, we we tend to have a, a pretty free floating uh, dictionary of words to use. You know, <laughs> um, so it, it's kind of it's best to know like when and when not to use uh, certain terms or or talk about like honey do lists for the commander versus like you know you know, you know what I mean like when yeah people, the terminology is yeah <laughs> yeah people talking about like you know complaining about the work or or you know um just just speaking freely like for whatever reason mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so so when you guys talk about the topic of bros to supervisor you're literally talking about that transitional phase at that moment right absolutely yeah yeah yeah, so. I definitely, I definitely struggled when, whenever Scott first made staff to like to maintain customs and courtesies in the shop because like I was so used to like my first year and a half or so of knowing him, just like oh what's up, Wars, blah yeah. blah blah, and then like he made he sews on staff and I have to like constantly remind myself that like, so I can't, to, can't just talk to, to him that way. To be clear, I was never the person that reinforced that. I, I that doesn't <laughs> that didn't bug me, but we had of course other folks in the shop that made that. Uh, a thing because I, I just don't want to be that guy that's like oh yeah i made everybody call me sergeant horse <laughs> right 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 yeah i mean um uh, so like you said time and place also right and then there's Absolutely. professionalism mm -hmm. that needs to yeah. take place and, and and a lot of people have a difficult time making that transition uh i mean jacob you might have like forgot every now and then but that's not that's not the difficult like when you think of people having a difficult time with that transition it looks a little bit different than that right and that's on yeah. both sides uh, you know from from the member uh maybe it's the airman and also the newly you know the new nco right they're, they're yeah. transitioning and it's difficult on both sides um so jacob on your perspective from your perspective as you know someone seeing scott transition what was what was going through your mind and and what what, what made it difficult um you know honestly i'd say scott made it so that it was not difficult because mm -hmm. like you've heard him talk he's so like diplomatic and like <laughs> not monotone but he doesn't he doesn't get very emotional not to say he's not passionate about the job but just like he wouldn't get too emotional when like leading the crew in certain ways that he wants to lead it or whatever and like that made it pretty easy however when i transitioned into the nto i i don't have that same personality and i'd say where i struggled with was like because like i'd be senior airmen were my buddies but now i like i'm on a crew leading them and it was kind of hard to separate that for a little while i'm sure with specific people too i think we talked about it like there, there yeah. are certain folks that had harder times than other than others yeah. you know kind of getting used to you being an nco yeah mm -hmm. yeah i would say i mean frank could probably attest to this i mean it wasn't D very different than for us when we were transitioning and you know uh, in his career field versus you know me in our career field uh it it, it definitely gets weird right because you're literally yeah. we're, we're at the house drinking with these guys right and then now you're now you're like supervising three of them <laughs> and it makes yeah. it an interesting uh in interesting uh environment to to try to navigate yeah, I thought it was always it was always like a running joke where your friends would be like, "Oh man, you're already, you're already changed. I could already <laughs> yeah. see it. Look yeah. at look at you." And you then they're like, "See, yeah, they're like, see, I knew you were a lifer, right?" And then they would yeah. call you lifer, yeah. right? Uh, but but that's that's you figuring out what you're supposed to be because your friends aren't the ones that are gonna you know you're not gonna live in the dorms forever. Right? right, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hang out with these guys forever. Maybe there might be a handful that you will keep in touch with for for the rest of your life, you know. Um, but you have to figure out where where you fit in in, in this thing. Yeah, I think it's um, it's it's so you can I don't believe in blanket statements. So to to say, okay, well, I'm just gonna go full robot and now I'm your supervisor, right? I mean, that's just yeah. unlikely, right? It's ineffective and it's not even authentic, right? Because we've got to mm -hmm. balance that authenticity with it. But to but also at the same time, you got to be able to have that trust in with that within that team that everybody's going to act accordingly as well, right? So I think that's mm -hmm. that's like that needs to happen before the transition, right? Not after. And when, when we start executing after, that's when stuff goes raw, wrong. Absolutely. And I think that kind of plays into the time and place piece as well. Um, because if, if people aren't willing to, to uh, conduct themselves appropriately, it's kind of, uh, it, it's, it, makes that, it makes that transition a little dif difficult. Like if people don't understand like your parameters of like, you know, hey, you know, 
this is this is how we act here and this is how we act over here versus like uh i don't know i i kind of I, lo- I lost my my trajectory with that one but, yeah yeah no I, I think i know what you're saying i mean it's it's really so you have to be able to respect each other enough to understand how to you know to to behave right and right. behave it's, it's a terrible word to use. I didn't want to use that word, but, but, but I mean, like, and, and, you know, but in a way, you know, you got to do that, but at the same time, we're human, you know, right. and, and yeah. to not have those build those strong relationships that, you know, there's, there's a risk assumption that every leader makes. And that, that, that is on the leader, right. On the person that's, that has seniority. And there's a risk assumption, you know, that they take. And if they don't want to take any risk, they're probably not the great leader anyway. Right. right. So if you, you're going to have to take some risk and, you know, let, let people inside a little bit. It's just, it's just, that's the difficult part. Where's the rub? Where, where's that, yeah. that spot at? Right. So yeah, you need that investment. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you guys feel like during that transition that you might have lost a few friends? Oh, absolutely. I uh, yeah. I actually had like a list of things to talk about like during the podcast. <laughs> yeah. And that was one of them. Um, I, I don't think I necessarily lost friends, but there was definitely uh, uh, like a role, uh, like roles changed, like as far as like how uh, involved I was with certain people. Um, and, and of course, yeah, there are people that get, that kind of get burnt. Uh, you know, they, they feel like, oh, you know, uh, kind of like Frank was saying, you know, like, oh, you you changed, you know, you're not the same anymore. Oh, you're you're NCO now. Right. We can hang out with you, blah blah. blah. Um, but at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, it's it is what it is, and you know, you, like you said, it's kind of, you know, you're prioritizing, you know, figuring out your place and 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 getting there and, and making sure they know that as well. It's, but not not in like the like you said, you assume the risk, kind of like still maintaining some sort of you know rapport. Uh, because you have to, like, you, you don't, you don't get buy-in and investment from people from just being a robot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's like when I, when I made it, I, de- I wouldn't say that I lost friends, but there was definitely like a wall that was like put up. Like as soon as, as soon as it was, as soon as I sewed on and like I had to start like leading, it was, that wall was there. Your, your destiny, your destiny online party shrunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, uh, wait, let, let's start looking at ranks real quick. Who's allowed to be in here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, wait, you, you, you've gone to ALS. You're allowed to come in. You're allowed to come in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you lose some friends, possibly, right? Uh, and that, that wall that you just talked about, Jacob, did, where, how did that manifest? Did you, do you feel like that was partially you creating it or the, the institution creates it or, you know, and it just exists or, or the, I, or, I think or it's this. like a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, oh, you know, okay. like as soon as the rank is sewn on, people kind of like see that. And then, um, me trying to like play my role in the Brown book mm-hmm. kind of le- leads to that as well. So it's just another like just a hurdle to get through. Like I wouldn't say things got like really tensioned, but it just wasn't as relaxed as before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's gotta be. So I liken it and you know, some people might not agree with me, but I liken it to when you become an NCO or even a senior member that's graduated from Airman leadership school. And now you have the ability and you're qualified quote unquote to be able to supervise human beings, right. And try to help them mm-hmm. become better human beings that you're responsible for their training, their development and all of that great stuff. And, and I mean, you're still trying to figure out who you are at that point. You know, yeah. I mean, I knew, I knew I was still no knucklehead kidding. at that time. <laughs> you know, I, I know I was still knucklehead trying to figure mm-hmm. it out if I figure it out. So it's a big responsibility because it's not the same as being a supervisor um, in the civilian world. Right. I mean, like you're responsible for a lot more. Your clock doesn't you don't clock out, <laughs> right. you know. Yeah. I mean, y- your subordinates need you. And, you know, what if uh, one of the airmen come in, and he smells all day and you're like wondering why he smells bad. You got to figure <laughs> out like why, why is airmen stinky, stinky. Right. You got to figure out, you know, did, did, did they uh, did they not know how to do their laundry? Did they play video games yeah. all night or or did they choose to buy um, buy uh, buy food instead of detergent because they're out of money? You know, what I mean. Like, you know, it is all things that you got to kind of navigate through. And I think it's probably one of the most confusing and, and challenging times um, for our airmen when you're transitioning from um, just going to work in the E4 mafia and trans, trans, transitioning right into that NCO <laughs> core, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I, I gl- I'm glad that you mentioned the E4 mafia because it was kind of like, it, that was like a running joke too. Um, I, I remember the shop, I think, 
there was one there was one dude specifically Fitz, I am sure you know who I'm talking about, but he, he would always make that joke, oh, he for mafia, blah blah blah. I'm never, I'm never gonna make staff. Uh because you know, it's kind of like, you know, certain people kind of having to justify to themselves like, Oh, I I didn't make staff, so I'm just gonna <laughs> in my in my tier. Uh yeah. yeah. Life goals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Life goals right there. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's, it's but awesome. you know, so how old are you guys? Uh, I'm 28, about to be 29 in September. All right. Uh, 25. Oh, yeah. So Jacob, Jacob doesn't even know what day it is, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His brain's still forming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, my point, my point of asking you guys is, uh, you know, I think for a transition, for you to become a supervisor and then, you know, you're managing other people, man, you're still trying to manage yourself. You know what I mean? Like right. that, you're still For trying sure. to figure out, you're still trying to figure out where, where you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to be acting, you know, as a young man or, you know, a young woman in the air force, you know, our, our supervisors that are transitioning, it's, it's a, it's a challenge just, just in that realm by itself, not even talking about the interpersonal skills that it requires to be an effective supervisor. So, um, and then you talked about the barrier, man, that barrier gets bigger, you know, oh, every, yeah, every time you make a rank, it, it just gets it, the, the barrier gets bigger. And then the conversations that you're privy to get smaller and smaller, especially if you're yeah. uh, around the, the E4 mafia, like you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think that, was that a thing, Frank, when we were coming up? I mean, it sounds, it sounds cool. I don't remember it being. It was around. there. Oh, it was, was it? There. Yeah, I, yeah, I might have been. I might have been a member of it, and then I was kicked out. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was a thing. I just don't remember it being termed that. <laughs> I don't remember the E4 Mafia yeah. thing coming the, into. The pro the problem with the E4 Mafia is the pay is terrible, so yeah. I just didn't stay there long. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Yeah. It is. It is pretty rough. Man. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get out as soon as you can. You got to get out. I'm like, no, I can't have ramen noodles and hot dogs anymore. Roll. No more tornadoes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's Man, I haven't, terrible. I haven't People had one of those in a minute. Yeah, a <laughs> yeah. lot, a lot. It was actually a lot of the dudes that work with you, Frank. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they grab <laughs> Poor dogs, maintenance, yeah, dirt boys, you know, like they all eat that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And cops. Yeah, defenders yeah, cops. too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so awesome, man. Hey, so Scott, what what else you got uh, jotted down over there? Because I was thinking like, because there's a lot of challenges and things that come up, right? Um, I, I'm going to do a quick, like little, little quick read of it. So it's kind of like, so from top to bottom, it's got like forced to develop, you know, better leadership habits because you're in that transitional period. Cause you don't have full leverage quite yet, you know, yeah. because you're not established in the role and obviously the losing friends, um, you know, fostering that 360 respect, because like, like I said, you're still, you're still in between, um, shop dynamics. I mean, that's kind of, uh, it's, it's easier to remember what you wanted from a supervisor. So, you know, like, or, you know, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's kind of like you, you get, you get to a point. I think some people do at least where they kind of forget where they came from. Yeah. Like, I don't know why people are complaining about all this stuff. I don't know why all this stuff bothers people, blah, blah, blah. And, but if you took a step back and we're like, Hey, I remember how stuff was when I was coming up um, and, and exercise some humility a little bit to, to admit like, Hey, I did have trouble in the come up, you know, yeah. or where I needed this and, and, and using those things as those, those remembering those things and being able to facilitate, you know, things that possibly you were missing as a, as a troop um, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and, and then I was talking to my wife yesterday, actually, and I, I was trying to figure out like a, a term to coin uh, because uh, like I listened to the Lama language and like people kind of have these different, you know, terms that they use, use makeup and stuff for things. And I, I call this one like the butterfly moment, you know, you have like the, the the, the caterpillar stage where like you don't realize that there's even a lot of problems and pupil stage where you realize a lot of problems and you complain but it's not within your scope of influence and the butterfly moment being like oh holy crap like i'm in that position now where i can like change that um and there's a lot of that in that transitional period of being like oh man like i can do something about this finally and then actually being like oh now i have to have to act and develop a plan like all this time i've been complaining i never had any you know real real effect on it and there's a lot of um accountability you know, i think involved in that as well um, as far as like, you know, be, being a, not just being an idea guy mm -hmm. and, and actually you know, moving forward with things because it's your responsibility to do that as an NCO. 
Yeah, that, that's that's interesting. I, I mean, you think you gotta think about it. You're like, man, why is it always like this? Why do they yeah. always do this? You know, and then you're like, wait, I'm they. <laughs> I'm they now. <laughs> I'm part of they now. Yeah, that's me. I'm doing that. Yeah, it's funny. That's probably that that, that butterfly moment <laughs> occurs to everybody a little bit differently at different stages. Um, I'll be right back. My wife got locked out. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's life. <laughs> that's life right there. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that that's a lot of good stuff. Did you do you feel um because uh, I, Scott, I remember one of the things that I always thought about you um, was not only that I could tell that you're you're a, a great airman, but you had strong character. And I think you know a lot of times you see that through just different behaviors, right? And I remember uh, when you were going for ALS instructor, right? Ah. Yeah, I remember. I remember uh, you're going for ALS instructor, and I found out that you had already interviewed and didn't get picked up, and you went in there and, and did it again, right? And um, I thought right there that that shows a lot of character because how many people they just don't they fail that first time or they don't get picked up that first time or whatever it might be, and they're like, I'm done, you know? They they didn't want me, you know? What I mean, like it's just I'm done with it. And I thought there was a lot of character that that you jumped into that, but I remember there was another time where. Um, we were, we needed to fill some quotas for developmental special duties. And, you know, by the time information filters to me, it's been filtered quite a bit. So I'm like, so it had, you know, two, two career fields that you were okay with going to. And I was like, okay, but you know, we need some more TIs. We need some more training instructors. So I called you, you came into the office. And I was like, Hey Scott, what do you think about being a TI? He said, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> you know and i was like i was like man that that's awesome right i mean like you're willing to take care of business and whatever it was and um and i think that just speaks highly of you um so knowing with all that in mind you go to als the first time you're you're an airman you're going through als do you feel like you were well prepared to make that transition um i i think with 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 that curriculum yeah it was it was awesome i think i think for me like my i i i think it would be uh presumptuous of myself to assume that i don't need any further interpersonal development right. uh but i think at the time uh my bigger focus was on like the supervisory admin stuff that i needed mm -hmm. improvement on so i feel like that was that was facilitated really well and uh now now that the new curriculum is i think more focused on like how to be a a, a more involved supervisor and then you know capitalize capitalizing on like those interpersonal issues and stuff like that. Um, I feel like that, that would, that would have been awesome if I, to, if I had gone through that as well. Um, but I felt like, you know, at the time for me specifically, like w with, with the skill set I felt like I, I had at the time with the interpersonal mm -hmm. stuff, uh, yeah. they, that, that was, that helped me out tremendously, like with the bullet writing and stuff like that. Like I'd already gotten kind of like a jump on that, um, for, for, for various reasons, but it was nice to kind of have like a solid sort of baseline to go off of. And then, uh, having that, you know, that simulated supervise, uh, like, supervisory feedback session where you, mm -hmm. you know like you're talking about you got to talk to a stinky kid and be like hey what's 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 good in your home life like what why why do you smell uh because like you, you never <laughs> nobody really thinks about that like there's a there's a whole array of of crazy stuff that can be going on in your troops life to be making them smell mm -hmm. or making them not pay their bills or make them you know act a certain way at work or whatever and you have to be able to to have those those tough conversations and and uh you know, get to that the empathetic leadership. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how, how about you, Jacob? Did you feel like it, like that airman leadership school, you know, uh, equipped you well enough to, you know, first of all, become a supervisor, but then also deal with the, the weird transitional phase. Um, as far as the transitional phase, I don't know if the curriculum helped out too much, like as far as like how to deal with the relationships changing as you progress. But with the interpersonal stuff, I think it definitely, it was definitely the, the awesome instructor team over there. But um, my instructor, I think, definitely helped me prepare for that stuff. Because it's funny, like day one of me having a troop after ALS, he, he's like brand new out of tech school. <laughs> he hits me up. He hits me up and he's like letting me know about all this stuff. So I go over to his dorm room and we hash it out for like three hours. And then I head back to the shop and I let like the section chief know that like there's some stuff going on. And I was like, man, I'm glad that ALS made me do these pretend scenarios because I felt like I was I was prepared for that. So that's awesome. That's awesome because we love doing that. When you don't know how to supervise yet, and you just get your certificate, you're good. So then we give you like the brand new airman that doesn't know anything yeah. either. Yeah. <laughs> it's the for best sure. environment. <laughs> yeah. 
So, hey, you guys hit on you guys hit on interpersonal skills. I mean, a few times. And um, so, what do you think about you know how we prepare you for the transition in regards to intrapersonal? Right? Do we feel like? Do you feel like we prepare you guys enough for that in regards to how much confidence you have in yourself? You know, how how to build self esteem in others. Um, and, and so, in in that regard, how do you guys feel like we prepare you? Um, I, I think as an institution, I don't know if that has really materialized yet. Um, I mean, I, I think me personally, like that was just something I developed over time from mentors and, you know, peers and stuff and, and even, you know, people that I supervised, you know, helping me with those issues, just learning things from them. Um, I think that's kind of like an ongoing thing. You know, I don't think anyone's ever really at that point, like of that self-actualization or whatever, um, where, you know, you, it's always something I think they can be improved on. Um, yeah, I'd hard have to, to, I'd have to agree with Horst on that one. Yeah, yeah, it would. It's. I definitely agree with him on that. Like, as far as like any PME goes, that I wouldn't say that's really too hit on, but um, that's like kind of like OJT, like talking with the the mentors around the shop or around the squadron or whatever. Like, that's where you really pick up the the, the nuggets of info, mm -hmm. or this um, this new medium, this podcast. Yeah, uh, this is. A <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate you. We appreciate you guys listening, man. It's awesome that uh because when we started doing this, I was I know I think Frank and I were talking about some of the other guys too. We we're like, man, we, we get to have conversations with amazing people and then we just broadcast it out into the ether and see if anybody listens. And then when they're listening to it, they get to hear like conversations that they probably would never been privy to. And I was like, Man, I wish I would have had something like that when when I was, you know, an NCO or an airman. Um, be able to hear a couple of chiefs talk about something that's pretty authentic and real and um or just talking to whoever it might be yeah this is this is my therapy session so you know, <laughs> you, know, like, you know i get to talk to you know fine gentlemen like yourselves we you know the other day we had you know professionals from different industries you know we've had you know a chief's panel on here so I, when i say therapy session i mean I'm like, i really get to you know talk to you guys about you know, the different challenges that we have growing up and transitioning through through the professional arms that we're in. So really appreciate you guys being on it and sharing your experiences. It's been sick. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, hey, hey, what do you guys, uh, so you, we were talking about the transitioning piece, but what did you find, because we talked about the challenges quite a bit, but what, what did you guys find as like some of the most rewarding parts of it? Uh, and let's start off with Jacob. Um, I think the most rewarding part is like, it's more specific to our career field, but for me, like being on a team that like completes a project and like helping lead the, the younger guys or like the newer guys, not necessarily because it's a lot of times now I'm the younger guy amongst the airmen, but, um, <laughs> like being a part of a team that accomplishes something for me and like knowing that I had a port, like a part in leading that team to that success is like a lot of fulfillment for me. Yeah, that's awesome. How about you, Scott? Uh, I think I think my my biggest thing, and, and at least connecting it to like where I found my purpose in in the job, is uh is the development of people. Like, uh, Fitz Fitz got like uh, a damn functional level award. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyone from our shop at Spang had gotten anything like that for a minute. So mm -hmm. like I, I felt like you know watching him grow and achieve stuff like that was super huge. And, yeah. and just just other people too like you know other troops that i've had other people that you know i've i've you know either had as friends or you know been on crews with and stuff like that um and, and just watching them become better people not just airmen but like just whole human beings yeah. like you know so set set them up for success regardless of whether or not they decide to make this a li lifelong thing like till retirement at least mm. oh yeah for sure awesome. so do you guys I mean, so responsibility wise, do you feel that, um, and this isn't just that maybe at Spring Dollar or where you're at now, but just general overall, do you feel that, uh, that your tier is empowered enough to do what you need to do to take care of them and develop them and also take care of the mission? I think that depends on where you're at. I think mm -hmm. right now, like my current local leadership is sick. They're awesome. Mm -hmm. and they, yeah. they like, they they give me uh, they empower me to do a lot like as far as you know setting standards and stuff like that within the shop and like you know follow up with projects holding people accountable things like that 
um, that that stuff like that's awesome. But I can't say that that's necessarily the case everywhere. And obviously you have your, your micromanaging folks and that's just kind of a fact of the, of the business. It's just different leadership styles or whatever. Um, but you know, for me currently, like it's, it's great. I, I, I think, I think it, it also being empowered also kind of like forces you to be accountable mm -hmm. um, because you, you can no longer like be like, Oh, well, this was on so-and-so. I was like, nah, man, like we told you this was, this yeah. ball was their court. Like, you know, you, you're accountable for why these things are or aren't happening. So, um, you know, that to me, at least that that's, it's nice. Yeah. That's awesome. How about you, Jake? I'd say like at, at Spengalum, I think the culture towards the end, when I was leaving there, they were really trying to empower the NCOs to make like NCO decisions, specifically speaking, the staffs there as the, as the number of staffs grew. But, um, here, like every week we have a, an NCO tier meeting where it's just the staffs and techs and. We hash out like any any issues that we're seeing arise in the shops, how how we can better handle our, our situations and whatnot, um, and the, like empowering us to be able to fail. Like there have been a couple times where projects kind of go off the rails and like like yeah we're like kind of chewed out, but it's more so in a constructive way to ensure it doesn't happen again. So right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, if you don't give people the responsibility, it's really hard to hold them accountable and expect, you know, great things from them. I, when I was, when, um, when I got to Spang Dalam with you guys, I remember there was something as simple as we had a top four and we had 600 people in the unit and we had a top four and it just baffled me. So I remember when I talked to the senior NCO here, I was like, why do we have a top four? Because usually you only see that when you have a small group of people and you need to have more people in that group, right? But I said, you guys know what you're doing when you say it's a top four. You're telling that, you know, the other tier that they're on their own. That like basically you're, if you're saying tech stars and above are leaders, you're telling the staff stars that they're airmen. Without saying it to them, that's what you're telling them. You just cut the line right there, right? And um, so, you know, that was a big part of what we were trying to work on um, after I got there with the team was let's make sure that we, you know, give our NCOs that responsibility to lead the airmen and then we empower them and we instruct them and we give them all the development that they need to do so and hold them accountable when they're not doing their job. I think it's funny that you mentioned the kind of separation of the, of the like, kind of like leaving the staffs almost like in the dust type of thing, because mm -hmm. I think like just as a, as things are right now with like a lot of old heads kind of cursing the system talking about like, Oh, these people, everybody's making staff, blah, blah, blah. Like it took me forever to make staff and I got more experience. So they're, you know, the, in their minds, like, you know, it's, you're not a real staff because you made it, you know, sooner than later or whatever. Um, and, and I think that, that, that also kind of implies that on like a, on like an air force wide level, I think, you know, regardless of what your career field is, like if you're like a fast burner or whatever, or, or, just somebody that just happens to be younger and, 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 you know, excelling faster. Um, yeah, I know, I know that a lot of that contributes to, to that sort of, um, that, that not necessarily the negligence, but sort of like a, you know, still making that transition, I think even harder. Right. Um, because you, you not only are, are trying to figure that out, but other people are expecting you to still just perform at senior airman level. and just as a staff, that's weird. Right. Yeah. If you treat people that way, you treat people a certain way, they'll start behaving that way. Right. I mean, you're, you're reinforcing it. Yeah. I mean, and that's a big issue that I see. And that's why I'm so adamant about that. We got to make sure that um, uh, staff sergeant, I don't care if you're a three and a half year staff sergeant or you're a eight year staff sergeant, you know what I mean? You're a staff sergeant. You need to act like a staff sergeant and you need to be responsible for what you're responsible for and act accordingly, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you bring up a good point, though, like when you talk about separation, you know, you have the top three, which is a traditional organization in either units or across the installation. Um, and then you got your five, six, and then you got, you know, some people call it ace or, you know, basically it's the airman tier. Um, do you think there's value in that separation or do you feel like there's exclusion there? Right. And so, like, you know, especially when we're talking about the five, six to the, the top three. Do you, do you feel like there's value in that, in that separation and there should be that way so that the five sixers can learn how to, or want to get to that point? Or do you feel like that's exclusion? I, I feel like um, it kind of just depends on, on the, yeah. Yeah, because I know um, like I've, I've heard different things from different people, um, but I don't particularly have a strong opinion on it, but based off of like, 
you know, how I've heard other people speak about it. I, I, th- I think a lot of people um, like liked being included into the in the top four just because you kind of are privy to other information to to, to better disseminate that within your units mm-hmm. or, or your sections rather. Um, and then I've heard, you know, there, there's value in having a five six because then um, top three can kind of focus on these issues, and then five six. It like it's kind of a better delegation of 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 uh, you know squadron management or whatever. Um, and, and as far as like you know whether it's morale related or or, or professional development or whatever, mm-hmm. um, just kind of having the separate tiers of of you know uh, almost in accordance with like the enlisted force structure and things like that. Okay. I'd have to say it's like it's got to be dependent on that council or the councils of like whether or not it's inclusionary or exclusionary. I feel like it could go both ways. It just depends on who's leading it and who's got the oversight. Yeah. And I think that's it's like what it's good to have probably, you know, if if there isn't the inclusion like organization wise, there should at least be like a rep from either or to, to, to liaise between the, the two or three of them. Um, to, to to still facilitate that sort of flow of information yeah that's a good point yeah no i think that's really effective too and i think um when you have the you know the top three and when you break it down like that i think one of the advantages and i know there are disadvantages as well but um, one of the advantages is that you know when, i remember when we had that top four it was just really confusing because we had all these um tech sergeants that were you know because we always want to push our our our, our young folks to develop their leadership skills so now they're all in charge of the top four and those, you know, they're cutting their teeth and it, it made it interesting. But when, <laughs> then you, you don't, we didn't even have a five, six whatsoever. Like we didn't, I don't remember that. <laughs> there was just not, no NCO tier at all. And then there was like an airman group and I was like, what, what's the yeah. staff sergeants doing? <laughs> you kind of left them out there. When you have that NCO tier, I think it's, you talk about NCO business, you know, you talk about stuff at that level. And, and then also that tech sergeant gets a leadership perspective from, you know, leading their peers right lead actually leading their peers mm-hmm. and i think that's one of the most important most difficult things to do is lead peers right to, to yeah, learn yeah. that influence so um there's a lot of benefits there but i'm sure also i think we just need to have there's gonna be times when you have a meeting with everybody just an entire yeah. discussion right absolutely yeah it's good stuff but man so um as we're kind of wrapping this thing, we've already been talking for like an hour, guys. It's pretty cool. <laughs> As we wrap this up, I wanted to give each of you an opportunity before we get into this leadership rapid fire question, which uh, we're gonna we're gonna ask each of you a question. Um, but oh man, uh, yeah, <laughs> a couple questions actually. But uh, we want to give you all an opportunity. What would you uh, maybe some tips or some final words on someone you know transitioning from that bro to supervisor? Um, what are some some last words you would you would provide for some folks? Uh, don't, don't burn the bridges for the sake of, of establishing yourself as an NCO. Like you still want to maintain rapport with your subordinates and like your, you know, you, your working group of, of folks, because like, it's not like your staff now or a tech now and like you just leave them behind and they're just not part of your everyday life. Like you still have to work with these people. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, uh, you can still have barbecues with people as long as it's not like exclusionary, you know, you can still have, you know, you can still hang out with people as long as it's not affecting, you know, morale, mm-hmm. welfare, discipline, or, you know, 2909 stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the old uh, <laughs> adage, I'm not here to make friends. Is yeah. Not, uh, yeah. No, cause then, then lonely at the top, is is not like a it's not like a matter of like oh this is i'm lonely because of my duties it's like i'm lonely because i was a jerk yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely exactly. yeah i think that's a great point i mean utilize that platform whatever it is i mean as a platform and not a pedestal right i mean really you know utilize your role to help people not try to build a wall right yeah yeah absolutely how about you jacob um, I think the biggest thing that resonates for me is it's okay to not know something, but it's not okay to be unwilling to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I, that, <laughs> that's powerful. I love, I love that too, because there's so many people that are just like going on, like, yeah, I have no idea what I'm doing, but this just seems right. You know, especially yeah. with like try reading yeah. and stuff like that. 
people are still figuring stuff oh out. Oh my like, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll have a whole nother episode about the, the, the butt pain of Tariqa, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that, that's true. And I think, um, you know, and that doesn't change as you continue to develop and, um, showing that vulnerability. And I'm going to, uh, Scott, you said you listen to like every episode you hear how many times we talk about vulnerability, you know, um, and how important it is to leadership. Um, it's very important to just, just be like, Hey, I don't know. I tell my team all the time, like, Hey, I don't know everything and none of you know everything, but all of us together know a lot. So, you know, let's be willing to have mm-hmm. that conversation. And I think that's another, um, good reason to have those tiered groups because, you know, the top three, when I bring my guys together in the top three, I'm like, Hey, I don't know everything guys. But, you know, when we walk out of here, our NCOs expect us to. So let's ask the, let's ask the questions here with no judgment, right? And I think that's pretty cool to have that at every level. I like to play the card where before a meeting starts, I'm like, listen, I don't, I don't know anything. So we can, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? So the expectation is low and together we can come up with the best answer. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my tactic too. I try to find myself in the room where I'm the dumbest student there every time. Mm-hmm. So I <laughs> learn something. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, appreciate it guys. Y'all ready for this leadership rapid fire? I guess. Oh, <laughs> that's how rapid it is. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> it's, it's not too bad, too bad. So um, I'll, I'll rotate back and forth. So I'm going to start with Jacob on this one. All right. What is your favorite leadership trait? Uh, openness. Okay. Openness. You know, elaborate a little bit on that one. Um, like the leader being able to tell me what they expect of me or, or let, let they know that they have flaws and they're willing to work with me to like work on those or like they're open about like telling me what I need to work on instead of just telling me what they think I want to hear. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, Scott, favorite leadership trait. I, I think the same thing. Transparency. Absolutely. It's like, <laughs> that's like, that's like one of my biggest things I try to amplify. Like just like, you know, it, it, in my own section, just kind of like, um, you know, so, so we're, we're, we're like, we're at towards the end of year now. And like, we're like, okay, you know, you guys tell us like, we need, we need your lists and input on like, you know, tools, you know, equipment, et cetera. Like let us know so we can put in stuff like that because like sometimes those conversations aren't happening and then, you know, you get the complaints like, Hey, we don't have the right tools for the right job. Uh, we'll have <laughs> grinder wheels or something stupid. Yeah. Like you know, just because it's not being up channeled. Um, yeah. So transparency from both directions, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. We never have money. It's like, who's telling you guys we don't have money? Like, it's so weird. <laughs> I was like, who keeps saying that? I never said that. <laughs> uh, so, all right, cool. So uh, next one, I'm going to start off with Scott. What is your favorite quote? Charge oh, it to the game. Hand. Charge oh, it to the game. That's your own quote. <laughs> that's your own quote. <laughs> oh, he's like, that's from like Third Ward Houston. That's not me. I can't do that. Yeah. He said this all the time. Like coming up. Every single like. That's definitely not his own quote. <laughs> no, no, <I laughs> that, that was common when I was a youngster. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, charge it to the game. Is that yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's and it's not and it's not so much like because I think you know you, you hear the phrase and you're like okay that means that, like you just don't care but it's it's not so much that but like it, it's more of a uh, don't sweat the small stuff type of thing like you know if you know if you can if you can uh, if four years from now like it, it, you made this mistake you four four years from now it's not something that's gonna keep you up at night then you know don't don't kill yourself about it Charge the game. yeah it, it kind of goes into line it was funny i was talking to uh, the eod guys from spang yesterday and uh senior pasley was oh, he wrote man. an article a while back and it was called uh, some people need to get shot at right yeah, and, his, <laughs> and he was really just saying he's like man, until you get shot at, you don't really realize what's important and what's the small stuff, right? So he said mentally, he just thinks that all the time. I was like, man, some people just need to get shot at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. All right, Jacob, what's your favorite quote? Uh, have you guys seen Coach Carter? Uh-huh. Yeah. So the, the, the quote, everyone thinks it's Nelson Mandela, but it's Marianne Williamson. And it's uh, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond all measure. It is our light, not our darkness that most frightens us, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's, it says, I'm, I had to look it up. It's a real long quote. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it's like a poem. There's nothing, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure about around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make uh, manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. 
As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And that one is probably my favorite quote. I always debate putting it in my signatures on my emails, but I'm like, I'm not, maybe, maybe when I'm a senior NCO, but um, Dude, that would be really think, long. That would be like really yeah, long. A, a abbreviated version of that. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. No, like it's, it, it kills me when people say, um, and I, I guess maybe some people really mean it, but when people are like, Oh, I don't want to make the rank cause I don't feel ready yet. Like that's the first thing that comes into my head. I'm like, what are, like, what are you really afraid of? You know? afraid of success, yeah. Like the mm -hmm. responsibility of actually like achieving something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Good. Good, stuff. Good stuff. All right. All right. Back to you now, Jacob. All right. What, what would you, uh, what book would you recommend to an aspiring leader? Oh man. <laughs> oh, it's gotta be, let me look at my books real quick. I just, the, uh, the David Goggins one. Okay. Oh, stop it. I, like I just, like I haven't can't, read Can't forever. hurt me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a I great think book. not necessarily because of like the leadership stuff in it, because I don't know, like maybe towards the end, there's some more leadership stuff, but I think <laughs> the more about like conquering yourself, mm -hmm. yeah, it will help you. Cause that's what before I like, I, I still kind of struggle with procrastinating and like, uh, like, oh, I don't want to take all this stuff to the hazmat waste deposit. Like, I just want to throw it away. But um, <laughs> after, after reading it, it, it's like, I can't, it helps me hold myself to a higher standard. So that's good. I'm glad that way you're not getting anybody arrested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not getting fined by the EPA. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that book too. It literally like, when I'm in on a long run, like one of my long runs, I'm just like feeling tired and I'm just thinking of him cussing me out. <laughs> yeah. We, we won't yeah. ask you what your internal David Goggins voice tells you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, uh, okay. But we can't put that on a podcast, but <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good stuff, man. If you guys, uh, since you're both David Goggins fans, have you, uh, heard Jesse Itzler talk about how he had him live with him for 30 days? He had, he actually no, had Goggins no. live with him for 30 days. Yeah. That, it's amazing. He said he had him like wake up and do all kinds of amazing stuff. He he'd, he'd slip into bed with them. Yeah, it's all like time to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have gym memberships. This guy's like, I, know. Ah, I just want the I want the gym to live with me. Yeah, I just bring Goggins yeah. here. Yeah, he'll just the gym's got to get a membership to be with me. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think Scott. The David book kind of like sorry. Uh, the what? the David Goggins book kind of like plays into that. Some people need to get shot at too because it's mm -hmm. like providing that that uh that perspective of like you know you don't really realize you know how how easy things are or necessarily like how you know comparatively like all that stuff is like you know small potatoes and could e either you could either let it roll off your back or just take care of it mm -hmm. uh and then versus you know being a special operator right you know. yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i, I think that's uncommon a yeah, common amongst uncommon, uncommon amongst uncommon. Yeah, I think it's um a lot, a lot of great stuff in there. Talk, you know, to me, it's like how much are we leaving on the table? Yeah, you know, every, yeah. every day. I mean, those are big things, and doing the hard thing. I mean, that's that plays big into stoicism, which I'm a big fan of. You know, so um, yeah, building character for sure. So Scott, are you gonna stick with the same book, or are you gonna come up with a different one? <laughs> uh, I just knocked my knees out from under me. I mean, uh, <laughs> that, that was my thing. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, as far as my reading, I don't, I like, uh, my consumption of leadership material literally has not had anything in it up until recently with La Melange. Oh, so, that's pretty uh, cool. <laughs> well, and I think it's just because I've been put in a position where I, I, I felt like I need, I needed it more. Mm -hmm. You know, what I, mean? I, I felt like at Spang, it was, it was, I'm not, not, not that I don't have mentors here and things like that. Cause I do, I've, I've got loads, uh, <laughs> but but at Spang it was it was it was a uh, like everybody was was on yeah. the vibe yeah. everybody was on the vibe it was a lot and it was a, it was a it was a it was a pool of people that you could always have some some solid feedback from literally anybody so it, you know it, I I feel like now when I probably needed it more I've I've been reading more and I've had like I just started listening and and just as a supervisor too it helps because like I found like in like my feedbacks with troops and stuff I, I I'm reverting to like my own life experiences and then i just kind of sound like a selfish idiot because i'm just kind of like oh i did this i did that <laughs> and you know and um you know i i kind of want to have you know i, I got a subscription at master class mm -hmm. that's yeah. all over facebook yeah but uh 
but you know you listen to different people and like there's one lady that talks about like how presidents came up and like different political figures and like how you know th habits that they had and things to kind of like di different pools of things to, to 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 use as as like good feedback tools and you know besides just like my own personal experience because that's super narrow like it's just right. you know, it's not going to be applicable to, to everybody so I, I um so i mean if if that counts you know get a subscription to master masterclass it's, Nice, nice. Mike, Scott, and, you're going to have to give us a review on that. I mean, I saw some guy, Joe, you might need to get on it too, man. There was the a barbecue guy. guy? Like, yeah, the barbecue guy, the master <laughs> smoker. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking oh, I about it, man. I was thinking, that dude, that dude, is that dude from Austin? Where, he is. Yeah, yeah that's, 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 that's how he was from Austin. Yeah. That's going, you, better, you better get you a sixer if you're trying to get Franklin's barbecue because you're going to sit in there and find like 60 people. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So cool. So you're, you're quoting masterclass and llama lounge on your, uh, on your feedback. So that's, that's good to hear. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, all right, Scott, we'll start with Scott on this one. This is the final question and this is the, uh, what we would call the, the deep question of the day. And um, it, oh. it, it centers around uh, what we do at the Llama Lounge and we talk about all things, life learning and leadership. So it's however you want to interpret this question, you can answer it. How do you find your harmony between life, learning, and leadership? Uh, my wife. Hmm. Yeah. Like she, she's a huge sounding board. Uh, when I have stuff going on at work that I feel like, you know, I, is something I'm not encountered before. And, you know, I, I always bounce it off of her. And she's super awesome. Like, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at getting her like a GS12 job right now. Nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just kind of get her set up because like we had the baby and like you know we've we've kind of just been taking it easy because yeah. you know, we're trying to make sure our baby's yeah. doing well we'll put her in a school but yeah my, my wife is high balance all that because like you know she she has different work experience as well as like just life experience too so um we we, we grew up in the same sort of place but with different uh family dynamics so it's a lot lots of different perspectives uh and the leadership part like uh yeah all of it yeah, talk to her about everything. That's, that's, shout out to Courtney. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and now, Jacob, you have to pretty much say your wife because I don't know where you're gonna go <laughs> if, with this. If not, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just yeah. giving you some advice right for, now. <laughs> set me up for failure. No. So. <laughs> um, as far as life and learning go, um, me and Lena often bounce a lot of things off of each other because uh, she's got her masters and I have a CCA. But um, <laughs> she's got word, like, word. So, almost the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a real degree. Yeah. Um, so like as far as learning, I look to her a lot and I lean on her a lot. And then life, we kind of lean on each other. You know, we're still we're both just 25 making our way. Yeah. But as far as leadership, sometimes I feel like um, she has to lean on me a little bit with uh, some of the stuff she deals with because she's usually like the youngest manager mm -hmm. only being 25. And um, some of the some of the stuff is like kind of similar to what happens at work. So um, we just communicate and like talk about our days, and that's kind of like how we find our balances with everything. Yeah, she's smoking you on those runs, isn't she? I can beat her like short distance much faster. <laughs> I don't want to run like how you guys run, like ten miles, twelve miles. My all I'm saying is that my fastest mile and a half is seven fifty two. I don't Ooh. think I'll ever beat it, but <laughs> <laughs> whoa, yeah, that's, is that out of basic amazing. or like what happened? Like, yeah, it wow. was in so out out of basic. I was fifty pounds lighter than I yeah. am now, yeah. and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's just a. I was running a lot in tech school, and I one day for a PT test, I just like I was racing this PJ washout, and I got seven fifty two. One of my buddies, it was Artigas, but one of my buddies got 756 yeah. and the PJ got eight minutes. So it was, it was pretty wild. Nice. I, I like, I like almost passed out after that run, but. Shouts out to Artigas. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That's awesome, guys. Hey, I really appreciate you guys um, coming on. Um, this is probably this is definitely one of Thanks the funnest conversations yeah. you know um, that we have. Yeah, absolutely. You guys have a lot of great energy, great character, and uh, mm -hmm. I loved working with you guys. And um, it was just an absolute great. honor and a privilege. Uh, same here. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, this is super sick. I couldn't believe that we were even afforded the opportunity to be on here. So. Oh man. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Going to download this one when it comes out. <laughs> you're supposed to download all of them jake what's yeah. going on here yeah i do i do I, <laughs> yeah. my, my iphone's out of space it's the uh -huh. gopro stuff <laughs> awesome well i appreciate you guys and um, to all our listeners as always uh, uh be safe stay healthy and llamas are out llamas out llamas out
Thanks for tuning in to the Llama Lounge podcast. Be sure to visit the homepage for links to products and services related to this episode. And don't forget to subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice. See you next time.